Okay. All right, so let's start. So the usual disclosures, as Dr. Dong and Dr. Uh, Yue mentioned, uh, I uh, am the inventor of the human patient simulator and other devices. So this is my disclosure, and I've received funding from TATRIC, the Department of Defense. I still it's still ongoing. The National Institute of Health (NSF) and different industry and foundation groups. The, what I'm going to present today was funded by the NIH and also the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, NCATS. And the team members are John Qualls, Nicholas Kravenstein, who is the anesthesiologist in the team, Luan Cooper, who is a psychometrician, Dave Lisdes, who is a mechanical engineer like me, Chow Mei is at the University of Texas, San Antonio, and works with John Qualls, and Travis is a a fresh computer, freshly graduated computer engineer who just joined our team. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, this is the modeling and simulation affinity group. I'm going to talk about systems probing by simulation-based study hypothesis and, and then how we went from there to actually build a solution based on verifying the hypothesis. So the hypothesis was that anesthesia providers will use, will dose propofol for sedation, not for general anesthesia, but for sedation it becomes a bit more important uh, because of the loss of self-protective reflexes and unanticipated need for intubation possibly. And that uh, anesthesiologist would uh, dose the propofol according to weight instead of taking race into account. And some of the key concepts, and this is why I wanted to know whether there were any anesthesiologists or there were non-anesthesiologists, so I'll cover those. It's the concept of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, often abbreviated as PKPD. And then the concept of compartmental models to represent the body and how the body behaves when a drug is given. And also the concept of interpatient variability in PKPD. And then we'll talk about loss of consciousness during sedation and effect site concentration, which is different from blood or plasma concentration. And then we'll also cover sedation scores, which is a fairly subjective but also fairly objective way to give a score of sedation and analgesia to when observing a patient. And then we'll also cover the modeling aspect of considering pain stimulus as the antidote to sedation. And we'll also cover uh, EC50, which is the effective concentration at which 50% of a population will react, will give the desired response. And in that sense, it's the, it's the median response. So. Uh, am I going too fast, or you? Oh, this is the right pace. All right, I'll keep continuing. Well, one thing, Sam, a quick question. So, what we see in the screen is only a uh, uh, display mode. It's, a, it's a really it's a presenter mode. It's not really the full screen somehow. I don't know. Is there okay. Uh, I think I need to let me see. Nope, that doesn't do it. Uh, when I did the trial run, it seemed to work, so let me see. Are you using a Mac, right? No, I'm using my desktop. PC, uh, right? OK. Yeah, well, that, that, that's, that's OK, you know, because we see both your current slides or your next slides, if something that's, that's your intention, so that's OK. No, let me see whether I can I can move that. Um, Actually, do you see the same thing on your screen? No, I have a I have a split screen, and that's what's uh, creating this issue. I think. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Let me see whether I can address this. Quickly. Okay. 
Well, I think uh, if if you don't mind, I'll stay with this and try to see whether I can make it. That's bigger. okay. No problem. Yeah. Um. Let me see. Display settings. Maybe that is. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thank you. All right. So. Um, So we already went over the key concepts. Thank you for letting me know this was an issue. Uh, now we're going to go over the, so for certain drugs like propofol, uh, there is data now coming from emerging countries like Asia and uh, like India and China that Indians and Chinese are more sensitive than Caucasians to propofol. And when we talk of loading dose, it's the initial dose we give to a patient. That's why I call it the loading dose. And then, uh, preferably, the dose should then be titrated to effect, which means you give a little bit, you see what the effect it does, and you give a little bit more. You don't give too much at a time because you can't remove what you've given in excess. And then we'll talk about patient-centered medicine and, and personalized medicine, which this touches upon a bit, and also precision modeling and simulation. And, and then for the study, we actually use mixed reality simulation, which combines virtual and physical simulation, and you'll see that too in the video. So um, so what we, we talk about pharmacokinetics, so one common way to, to describe it, which I like, is that pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug. So when you take a drug, your body starts breaking, the, breaking it down right away before it can get to the effect site. And so that's the pharmacokinetics. And the pharmacodynamics is what the drug does when it gets to the site of the body, which is the effect site where it does its action. And for propofol, we believe that's a brain. And I'm going to show you quickly a Two compartment analog hydraulic analog model. Let's see what it will play here. And this is available on the web. And the reason I wanted to show you that to you is this is the concept of a compartmental model. So if we were modeling propofol in the uh, in in uh, in a non-ICU situation where we are not we are not concerned with a slow compartment, we can model the propofol as if it's a it's two cylinders, and the level of the liquid in the cylinder is actually the concentration of propofol, and that's detailed on the graph on the top right. So the the red line is the plasma. So you can see when I give a bolus, I start at a very high concentration and over time it gets reduced and conversely my tissue starts at zero and then climbs up and over time also starts fading because the body is, is metabolizing the drug. And uh, so that's, that's what a compartmental model is. This is a two compartmental model. And here is another compartmental model we built and this one I'm bringing it in because it has three compartments and then the one I will show later has four compartments actually. And the main reason to show this one is you can see we gave, if you look at the graph on the right, we gave a bolus at time zero and then we gave another bolus at about maybe uh, 15, 16 minutes. And you can see how the system responds. The red area is loss of consciousness. The uh, gray area is recovery of consciousness. So if you want to be somebody, if you want to have a patient between recovery of consciousness and loss of consciousness, which is the white band, you would have to adjust your dosing to keep the, the dose of concentration within the white band. But what makes this difficult is that no two patients are the same. So I'm going to click on this button called genetic polymorphism. And as I do that, look at what's happen, going to happen to this curve. So you can see for this patient, the, the, the system has changed. So there is a lot of variation within a race, 
But today's topic will not be about variation within a race, which we know about. It's going to be variation between races, looking at the median patient as representative. And all of this is available free of charge at the VAM website. So for proper fall sedation, the patient is supposed to stay sedated and to breathe spontaneously during a painful procedure. If you overdose propofol, you will get loss of consciousness, you get loss of verbal response, and you also get what's called loss of eyelash reflex, meaning when we touch your eyelash, your eyelid will not twitch in response. If we go too far, we will go into general anesthesia, which would be loss of self-protective reflexes like breathing. And in the case of Michael Jackson, we believe this is what happened. He had too much propofol. And that would lead to a bad patient outcome, especially if there's no anesthesiologist who knows how to intubate during unintended general anesthesia. And to show you that this is not, uh, uh, we, this is not something we are imagining, uh, in the state of Florida where I'm based, there has been a lot of cases of women who went in to get breast augmentation surgery and uh, uh, the plastic surgeon didn't uh, didn't uh, invest into having an anesthesiologist present to do the anesthesia and the person pushing the propofol didn't know how to intubate. So, um, and here is a, a list, unfortunately, of uh, six different people that was compiled in a book that a distressed father wrote when his daughter, that's his daughter here, uh, died at, I think she was uh, 46 years old when she died. She was born in 2003. And, and this is what can happen when propofol sedation goes wrong. There, there's actually fatal consequences. And that's the motivation behind our work. Uh, so I also will want to talk about effect side concentration. So the effect side concentration is actually the compartment, except it has zero volume, where the effect takes place. So it models the drug concentration at the brain, in the case of propofol. And it has a time delay relative to the central compartment concentration. Uh, and when we model it according to MARSH, the MARSH propofol model, which is used to run the target control infusion propofol pumps, our colleagues here uh, didn't uh, like the time to peak effect. So we had to uh, adjust our model to reflect a more clinically correct time to peak effect for propofol. And to do that, uh, we, were, we went back to the literature and found that the Struess model was a better fit. So here is the, the new compartment in a an hydraulic analog model. So on the in the middle, you have the plasma, the, also called the central compartment. Then you have the fat compartment, which is very slow. Generally, you can skip it and, unless you are modeling propofol use in the ICU of a days. Then this compartment becomes relevant. And then you have the muscle and tissue compartment, which is the faster compartment. And then the narrow cylinder here is the effect side compartment. And we are showing it narrow because it has no uh, volume, and it is also in many ways than the pharmacodynamic compartment. If you remember, we were telling you that PKPD, the PK is what the body does to the drug. So when you see the, the liver clearing the drug, that's the PK. That's the body breaking down the drug, the body redistributing it to the fat and the muscle tissue. So all that is PK. The PD is the, 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 the volume, the level of liquid in the central compartment making its way to the effect side compartment. And if the liquid level is above the ROC, which is return of consciousness, then the patient will be unconscious. And if it's above ROC, uh, above LOC, loss of consciousness, then the patient will, be, will lose consciousness and will not have verbal response. Whereas between between those two uh, hash marks, the patient is uh, sedated, but not totally unconscious. Any questions? 
So then we move on to the OAAS sedation score. So this is something that's well established. You can find this on the uh, ASA website and multiple other websites. And basically level five to three, you're conscious. Level two to zero, you're unconscious. And zero is where you don't want to be if you're trying to do sedation because the patient then would also probably lose self-protective reflexes, which is what we want to avoid. So in our case, we, we took that OAS sedation score and we created associated simulations to go with that sedation score. And I'm going to show you some videos of patient movement that go along with that uh, sedation score. So you can see here, this is not what was seen. This is a development tool, so we can create. And you can see this row is minimum sedation. This is mild. This is maximum. And so as the patient puts the endoscope into the patient's mouth, depending on the level of sedation, there's cuff, body roll, left arm, the patient trying to pull the endoscope out of his mouth. And uh, so that's a virtual 3D avatar of the patient and his level of motion, depending on whether he's appropriately sedated or not, relative to the stimulus he's receiving. So I'll let the video run it. So now this is mild sedation. And I'm not moving this. This is just a video capture of all the different um, movements of the virtual patient. And that's also why we wanted to use a virtual patient in addition to a mannequin, because this would be very hard, obviously. It's not impossible, but it would be very hard and very costly to do all this mechatronics with actual motors and, and actuators. And also, for the case of a study, you will see we will change the skin tone and the facial features of the patient to reflect different races of patients. So having a virtual system is very helpful in, uh, in allowing us to change the patient and show patient motion very quickly. So I already mentioned this. We modeled the, 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 the pain as a antidote to sedation. And this is how we model it in our uh, in our simulation. So each bolus of pain uh, had a spike and then a plateau, and then essentially uh, decreased. Um, we always talk about EC50. So EC50 is the concentration at which 50% of a population exhibits a response. And I apologize, I'm having a long wind up to this because I just wanted to make sure everybody has the same background as we go into the simulation, into the, the model itself. So then these are the, the papers we use to model the different races. So Mill et al. did a study with Caucasians. Uh, we're using the TCI diffuser pump and the predicted concentration at loss of consciousness for 50% of the population was 2.8 microgram per milliliter. Uh, Irwin did a study uh, using uh, uh, Chinese patients in Hong Kong, and he got a value of 2.66. And Lee also did a study, and he got a value of 2.2. And and uh, and it turns out Lee uh, Lee did a better job uh, in estimating the uh, EC50 for Chinese patients. Uh, it was a bigger study. It was 450 patients in five hospitals in Beijing, and they came up with a value of 2.2. Uh, Natarajan did a study comparing blacks and whites in Britain, and he found that the 
uh, blacks were more sensitive to propofol than whites, requiring only 1.16 milligram per kilogram for the main dose for the subverbal response compared to Caucasians at 1.41. And so based on that, we ran some simulations, some model, some modeling simulations, and we were able to uh, put the effect site concentration EC50 at 2.02 .02 micrograms per milliliter compared to 2.8 for Caucasians as we had earlier seen with Milne's data. And then the, the data from India came from Puri uh, and uh, again we adapted his data because his data was obtained with a pump that only showed plasma concentration not effect site concentration values. So using simulation we re-ran the study of Puri on a model that we developed and based on that we came up with a value of 1.88 micrograms per milliliter for Asians, for Indians, sorry. Uh, we, we have some data from the literature that indicates that the pharmacokinetics are similar. So we don't change the pharmacokinetics for different, different races. Uh, the only difference in response, therefore, is due currently to pharmacodynamics. And this is the, the, the table we came up with. So we have Indian at 2.3, I'm sorry, Indian at 1.88, Black at 2.02, .02, Chinese at 2.2, .2, and Caucasian at 2.8. And these are the OAS sedation score. Uh, the values are sort of grayed out because we still have to confirm them and we are in the process of getting them uh, published actually. So, um, so we already talked about loading dose and titration to effect. Uh, and I'm going to skip this slide. So now I'm going to talk briefly about mixed simulation. So mixed simulation is, is a spectrum. If you look at this diagram on one end on the left, you see the physical mannequin. This is the former version of the human patient simulator. And on the extreme right, you see the virtual simulation, which is the virtual anesthesia machine. And in between, you see simulations that contain both physical and virtual simulation, and that's what we call mixed simulation. So currently a lot of our work is actually in augmented physical simulation. It's funded by DOD. And, but we started actually in augmented virtual simulation when we did some work with uh, magic lens and anesthesia machines. So here's a mixed simulation that we did for a pilot study at San Antonio. So if you look on, in the screen on the projection screen, there is the virtual avatar, the 3D patient, and then uh, in front of the participant, there's actually a mannequin that the, patient, that the uh, user can interact with to, to touch or to do jaw thrust and trapezius squeezes and, and all that. And these are the three different uh, uh, races of patients, Caucasian, Indian, and African American. Um, so what we did is we, we had the patients, the participants fill a questionnaire and uh, then after filling a questionnaire they actually delivered propofol uh, in that uh, environment that I just showed you, that mixed environment to three consecutive patients in this sequence, Caucasian, Indian, and Black. We didn't simulate a Chinese patient because mainly for logistical reasons, the study session would have been too long, having four patients instead of three. So that's why we did that. Uh, we repeated the study in, uh, at the University of Florida. The first pilot study at San Antonio was done with medical students. The one at the University of Florida was done with anesthesia providers. So 13 faculty, 10 residents, 8 nurse anesthetists, 3 fellows, 3 AAs. And uh, 
it was a wide range of years, 28 to 68. One of the participants was the ex-president of the ASA, and a lot of variation too in delivering propofol. So let's look at the video. So in this video, we have an experienced anesthesia provider. You can see, we can see the eye signs. On this side, you can see a video footage of an actual upper GI endoscopy. Here are the vital signs. You can see he's doing a jaw thrust. And he can also either call in the number he's going to give or punch an infusion rate here. So, and that's the, the, essentially the situation we had. And this patient is probably over sedated, so he's not moving much. The virtual endoscopist is not present physically. We don't need her to be there physically. So, and you can see he's doing a jaw thrust right now to keep this patient uh, breathing. Again, here's the video of the real endoscopy, the virtual patient, the monitors, the jaw thrust, and the real anesthesiologist. And then when the data, when the study was running, because we had, uh, we were monitoring it and we were running the mathematical models and the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic models, we could track what was going on with each case and how many times jaw thrusts were given and what was the OAAS score. So this one was for a Caucasian, this one is for South Asian male, and this one is for an African male. And our preliminary analysis, basically, if you look, the top number is the range, the bottom number is mean plus standard deviation. So the loading dose, this is Caucasian black Indian, the loading dose was very much the same, 0.77 mean, 0.79 mean, 0.8 mean for the three races, and it was based essentially purely on weight. Interestingly, the total dose administered was significantly less for the Indian at 1.63 compared to 1.95. And that's because the Indian was becoming more uh, sedated and the anesthesiologist was becoming aware of that and they were backing off on the infusion. But because they had given so much, they, they, they uh, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. So the the duration of loss of consciousness, where the concentration in the effect site compartment is above the loss of consciousness level, was significantly higher at 207 seconds compared to 147 seconds for the Indian versus the Caucasian, and it was the case too for the black patient. And also, interestingly, the time to recovery was significantly longer, even though the Indian uh, he received less propofol. Once the endoscope came out, the time from the endoscope coming out to the Indian recovering consciousness based on the pharmacokinetic model and dynamic model was significantly longer at 522 seconds compared to 444 for the Caucasian, and it was the case true. It was also significant for the black patient. So this summarizes what I just described. So significant difference in duration, consumption, recovery time, but no difference in loading doses. Um, the Caucasians spent significantly less time over sedated than blacks and Indians and consumption was significantly higher in Caucasians compared to Indians and black. Uh, and the recovery was also significantly shorter for the Caucasian. Uh, so our conclusions were that the dose uh, was calculated according essentially to a formula that only took weight into account and that there's a general lack of awareness uh, of racial differences in proper false sensitivity in both medical students, which I guess we could understand, but also in anesthesia providers. Um,
So we did have a lower total propofol amount, which indicated that anesthesia providers were on the ball. They saw what was happening and they were backing off from providing more more propofol. Uh, and and based on that, we we also suggest that loading dose, especially in, in a situation where there is not an anesthesia provider who knows how to intubate, should take race into consideration. Um, so the study was done in Gainesville, as I mentioned, and then to we we were concerned that because Gainesville is a small college town and there's not a, a lot of diversity in the patient population, so we took the simulator with us to other ASA. I believe we did that at ASA when it was in New Orleans, so we still have to publish this. And we had 13 meeting attendees take a quiz, a, a survey. And it was very similar. So if you look, uh, there were 40, 48. Uh, let's see, there were 48 participants, uh, and yeah, there were 48. And then uh, the mean was very similar for what they gave as a loading dose: 1.14, 1.11, 1.14, and uh, and similarly here. So, so this is what we saw as far as the mean being very similar. That's the ASA group 13 and the UF group was 35, so that's why we come to 48. Uh, we are currently having a survey performed at UCLA and we're waiting for those results. We also have a, we just received surveys from Vanderbilt, so we're in the process of uh, compiling those data. So the same survey was done at Vanderbilt. We also have some anecdotal evidence of increased propofol sensitivity from talking with some of our colleagues at the APSMH meeting. Dr. Uh, Yue was there. Uh, and and uh, So I'm looking at the time. I think we have some time. So I can tell you personally, I am of Chinese ancestry. And about four years ago, I had a propofol sedation for colonoscopy. And I woke up an hour after I was supposed to wake up because I was given too much propofol. And then when I went for my second colonoscopy uh, three years later, I asked my resident to titrate me. And when I woke up this time on schedule, he, I asked him how much. And he said he gave me a third of what he would usually give. And I was good. So that was my own experiential learning. Uh, the other thing that's becoming clear, if you look at where, I don't know whether you can read it, but where the, the red circles are, I'm comparing the package insert for propofol from North America to the one for India. And you can see the dosing recommendation in India is half that of the one for North America. So that seems to indicate that at least in India, there's some local, local knowledge that Indians are more sensitive to propofol. Uh, the other thing I would like to touch on, since this is a modeling and simulation group, is we have model-driven simulators like the HPS. And I think as those simulators are used all over the world, uh, it becomes important that we make sure we understand what population was used to obtain the different pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic models that run those simulators. As an example, this is a picture I got from the Laidall website. So they, they have three different skin tones for their mannequins now. They have black, white, and brown. And uh, and I, I and I talk with uh, Laidall and, and Matty, which is now CAE. And unfortunately, their, their, the diversity they have in their mannequins is literally only skin deep. It's only the pigment they add to the rubber when they make the skin. There is actually the model 
uh, are not race specific in those instances where they should be. So, um, so I think that's uh, that's important for us in the sim in the modeling and simulation community to remember that that uh, in the case where either the anatomy in some cases we have found the anatomy is different or if the pharmacokinetics and dynamics are different we cannot just export those models to a country where the population is has a different racial makeup and that also then obviously affects the portability of scenarios because to completely validate a scenario takes a lot of time and ideally we want to be able to share them and and I am all for sharing but we should share them while at the same time being cognizant of the fact that if there is any uh, race specific aspects to it then those should be flagged and they should then be customized uh, before use in a different uh, country with a different racial uh, groups. So to 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 expand on on this, uh, where we said we need we need different different models. So what we did is recently we took all what we have learned and created a new model and got it accepted for and it's being published now in electronic copy in the Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. Uh, this is a very helpful diagram, I think. It summarizes what we have found so far. So there are four horizontal lines. I will walk you through this. The bottom line is for whites, and the x-axis is the effect site compartment propofol concentration in microgram per milliliter. The first hash mark you see here is the EC05 concentration. It means at this concentration, 5% of whites lose consciousness. This one is the EC50. So at this concentration, 50% of whites lose consciousness. And this one is EC95, which is at 4.2 or something. And it means at 95% uh, of whites will lose consciousness at 4.2 microgram per milliliter effect site compartment concentration. There is a there are two little uh, lines on each side of each of the tall lines. These represent the 95% confidence intervals. So there's 95% confidence interval for EC95, EC50, and EC05. And this is the same except for Chinese. And you can see the difference between EC95 for Chinese and white. The EC, the 95% confidence, the lower bound of the 95% confidence limit is coincident with the EC50 for Chinese. So that's why it looks as if it's missing, but it's not missing. It's coincident. And you can see there is this, this decrease. What is also important to see is that within a population, there's actually a lot of variability. So there is, uh, in that sense, more variability between the EC95 and the EC05 of whites than between the EC95 and EC95 of whites and Chinese. Then we did the same for blacks. And you can see they are even more sensitive than Chinese. And then the Indians are the most sensitive of all. The data are shown in dashed lines because these are data we extrapolated. The Chinese data and the white data are in uh, non-dashed line because these are lifted directly from clinical studies. Uh, the, the white study is from a Milne with 40 patients. The Chinese study is from Zhu with 405 patients. The black study was with 50 blacks. The Indian one is, is a pilot, really. It's only had 18 patients. But uh, it is very consistent with the data that Ortolani uh, collected in Malaysia and Italy, where he looked at Malay Indians, Malay Chinese, and Italian whites. 
and and also Malays, and that was very the the order the sequence of sensitivity was very similar to what we found using independent and different papers from Otolani. So uh, what I want to show you next is a point of care app for mobile phones that will work without Wi-Fi or cell phone coverage. Uh, so this will run on your mobile phone and I'm going to launch it now. It's going to take a while to load. Okay. Any questions while the program is loading? And and when you load it on your smartphone, it's going to take a while too, by the way, because it's a fairly big program. Hopefully it will run. Is this a mobile web? It's not a really a native web. Is it correct? I'm sorry. Is this a mobile web? Basically, it's a online. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes, it's 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 a it's a. Uh, you're using your smartphone as a web browser. We also have an an app that we could put out, but right now our Apple license is is out of date, so we have to put it up on the web. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Last year here at Bill. Professor Mark Greenwald joined the state. What's going on here? That's not what I wanted. Okay, hold on a moment. I, I know what's going on. I, I'm going to launch a different thing. Sorry about that. Um, Can you see that? Yes, I can see that. Okay, now it's loading. I'm running the executable. I was having some problem with the browser because I'm, I, it doesn't run well on Internet Explorer. It runs better on Chrome. So here, here is the the simulation essentially. So I can pick a time when I want something to happen. I can pick an amount. Right, so I can pick like 300 or let's say 150 and I can say administer and when I administer it, it will show for example this amount so let me, uh, let me change it to 100. Let me rerun it. All right, so if you look here, the effect side compartment goes to about 1.82. The, the EC50 for a Caucasian is 2.74 so therefore there will be no loss of consciousness in this for this bolus and then if I were to then give an infusion uh, a bit more 
I can basically keep the patient at a particular spot here and then if I go to an Indian patient you can see now that that same uh, amount of propofol will go over the blue line the blue line is the loss of consciousness line for the Indian and it's at a lower level so the curves have remained the same it's just the, the loss of consciousness line has dropped and this is a, a point of care app that will allow uh, people to uh, essentially run some predictions at the bedside as they're deciding how much propofol to give especially if they're not familiar with propofol and especially if they don't know how to intubate should the, should the propofol dose be too uh, potent. So I think I'm right about at the time I wanted to be at which is 345 which leaves about 15 minutes for question if there are any. Thank you Dr. Lamptan for your uh, great talk. Thank so, you. Um, uh, if anybody has a question please ask now or you can post on the chat box we can read for you. So when other people uh, uh, is thinking I can ask a question, a quick question for you. Hello? Hello. Go ahead. Abu Bida? You can speak now. Hello? Somehow, the, the song this doesn't work, you know. It's right. Working. So uh, I have a quick question, uh, Sam. So yeah. when you study the different providers, you know, from ASA or from your university, uh, are they same level? Are they all attending physicians or resident physicians? Does the training level have any difference for their performance? No. Secondly, if the the races of those physicians are they white physicians, or Chinese physicians, Indian physicians? Do they yeah. have their most, most of them were white, white and male, okay. which, is, which is what you would expect. I see. So, uh, um, so uh, what do you suggest, you know, in the future when we doing the education, we should do propose more uh, patient-centric, you know, the doses uh, with consideration with race, race profiles, right? We, we think so because, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I think it's, it's obviously a, a patient safety issue yeah. when, when uh, because, you, you know, th there are, when you look at a, at a patient of a given race, even though there's a lot of variation there as we saw, mm -hmm. you can't tell whether they go, they, they're going to be more sensitive. But when you look at a person and his name is Patel or Singh, and he looks Indian, then you you know that there's a very good probability that he needs less. So then you can from that then decide I'm going to give less, and then if he needs more, I can add more. Sure. And and, and that's and why is that also important beyond the the safety aspect? Is if we can reduce the recovery time then we could possibly also not only have better quality of care, but we could also increase the throughput in the GI endoscopy suite. Yeah. Because now instead of holding up a bed because the guy is taking an hour to wake up and he wakes up in 10 minutes, then uh, I can maybe squeeze another patient in that same eight hour day compared to before. Sure. So, so I think it's... it's, it's it's very important, you know, we should have this uh, in mind. Uh, the, regarding the approach, are we talking about education only or we should uh, proposing some automatic uh, dose uh, prompt, for example, uh, from the patient EMR, we can just automatic uh, prompt the providers with certain doses. Uh, of yeah, course, that uh, would be the ideal, of course, but, but that requires a level of integration where it's not the technology, it's the willingness of the players to play together, play nice together. Yes, yes, right? that's exactly. So, 
what you say that's that's like uh, it's almost trivial but but to get people to play nice that's a different thing right so because I think uh, regarding education definitely we can do that but also there's an associated cost because from technology standpoint if those uh, doses can based on the way the automatic prompt the providers with the overhead capability uh, right. with risk consideration so we we'll actually reduce the potential education cost as well right because that's education is also very expensive yeah. right long, long yeah. Run. yeah and I so and also I think it, it, it's it's a way to be beyond this propofol aspect I think what this is helpful is there has been a lot of talk of precision medicine, personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think of it as, you know, you need to get a, a genetic analysis before yeah. you, you, touch, you can be have pre precision medicine. And this is a, a pragmatic, uh, for lack of a better word, I call it poor man's precision medicine. Sure. Because you can do it cheaply, right? You just need to look at somebody and if his name is Wong and he looks Chinese, you say, okay, I'm going to go a bit uh, slower on the propofol. And, and what also helped me tremendously is there is a, a Caucasian anesthesiologist who just joined us and he practiced for 20 years in San Francisco mm -hmm. on a lot of Chinese patients because mm -hmm. there's a lot of Chinese in San Francisco. And when I told him what I was studying and I said, you know, there is anecdotal evidence and then I, I explain about my own personal experience and he told me this is not anecdotal I've been there 20 years I've seen it it's real yeah and then there's the paper from five hospitals in Beijing 450 patients or 405 patients so that's also very compelling yeah so this, I mean, this is real but but the, the, the community has not uh, absorbed it they are not practicing it and this is where I think the modeling and simulation community can lead the medical community in understanding and implementing uh, precision medicine especially because this is this is actionable we're not telling you to spend five thousand dollars for each patient before you give propofol right yes Yes, I think this is really, really time relevant because you know we are talking about uh, precision medicine because right now all the data you pro provided not only just for the the proper concentration also the, the, the this model you, you just shown up on the screen which is very relevant you know I mm -hmm. think uh, we have to moving away from the gut feeling to, to practical medicine to, to more data driven decision making this is really right. the future. Uh, yeah, I think one one barrier we have to adoption is is the most anesthesiologists, uh, uh, not most, I think many anesthesiologists will shrug off the importance of this work because they say, what's the big deal? If, the, if I overdose, I have a laryngoscope and I have an endotracheal tube. Yeah. So I'll intubate the guy and ventilate him. No big yeah. deal. And in some ways they are right and in some ways they are wrong, right? Because Yes, there won't be any death if you can intubate the airway. But what happens if you really never really even examine the airway because you never expect expected sure. to have to intubate and this is a melampathy fall? Yeah. Or or even if yes, you do manage to get the tube in, but now this patient is going to wake up an hour later than planned. So everybody everything for that day in that room gets gets stacked up. Well, so it, it it decreases quality of care. It decreases patient satisfaction. Exactly. I mean, if you ask a patient if there's a different options, probably he want to better his his own identity. You know, for for the uh, different races, you know, uh, medication doses. You know, I think no question he will want to his provider give the best care for him you know, possible. Right. Um, so that's that's I think. Uh, but uh, I think for the overall, your your project is very very interesting, you know, because you bring us to a different level of the simulation, and not just for education training for provider. Instead of using simulation for investigation for system factors, which impact impact a lot of a uh, healthcare delivery, and you know errors or the, the lack of the consistency quality, which patient right. deserve. 
So, um, but in general, uh, this has been less been uh, adopted by the uh, simulation community in general. How you think we can uh, partnership more people like you to moving forward this agenda because this is exactly the the goal for this group. Try to moving forward this. Uh, well, I, I think uh, I think one way to move this agenda would be to have a a, uh, a session at maybe the next or the simulation in healthcare IMSH mm -hmm. where we talk about uh, precision simulation. And uh, because this is not the only drug, my understanding is that opioids are also race specific. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah. So I, I think it's a it's a. First of all, we we are still struggling to get to get traction on this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we need help on on helping on helping people understand. How to use Propofol? How to use those models? Uh, we are actually going to conduct a clinical study. If it goes well, we may actually try to get other people to take part in the study, so that we we get to uh, understand whether what we have done works across the country, sure. and maybe take it outside the U.S. Well, you know, like, let me know if you want to do more like, globally, you know, for, for context in this China, you know, yeah. talk to people or so. And the, the, the other thing, you know, as we said, moving this agenda forward, you know, actually, would you mind mute the other person, please? So the other thing, you know, so uh, a lot of places doesn't have a uh, capability like you in the University of uh, Florida uh, for for expertise in this regard. You know how we can partnership like an uh, engineer like you to to, to 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 do this kind of work because really this is so uh, at once it's not in the traditional domain of medicine. Uh, right. which, uh, we are we are we are we are learning, keep learning from the engineering community. So any right. suggestions? Yeah, well, it's it goes back to money, right? So uh, if we can go for joint funds, joint proposals, that would help. So part of this work was done at University of Texas, San Antonio, mm -hmm. and uh, so the being a non-clinical faculty, I need to bring my own salary in uh, in in grants, and, sure. and so. Uh, so that's what we're looking at. We we're looking at submitting a proposal, yeah, uh, to do more clinical studies. A lot of the PKPD we have for blacks is based on British blacks. We don't know whether American blacks have the same distribution. So mm -hmm. that's something we need to verify also. Okay. Great. So anybody have other questions? Emily or Jade or Moreno or all of you. Between the session, Mustafa, or anybody have any questions? Please ask. Uh, okay, no, thank you. All right. Well, there's somebody uh, maybe on talk of Ma Miguel. Hello. You can speak now. Hello, Miguel Delgado. Your mic is on. Any question you have? Okay. Okay, so no questions. All right. Okay. Thank you, Sam. So uh, this information is on the pad. Is your contact your contact information. Okay. So people who want to contact you know can write to Sam directly and uh, thank you so much Sam for your uh, great presentation. So this video will be posted on the YouTube channel in about a week. Okay. And thank you so much. Uh, we are looking forward to next sessions. We will have a session in July uh, as well. So please uh, look at your email. So we'll send yeah. out the announcements. And will you, you, so you will send me the, the URL for the YouTube yes. when it's up? Yes, we'll do that. Okay. Thank, 
Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.